the Treaty of Paris and the Royal Proclamation of 1763, two key events from 250 years ago that permanently changed the course of North American history. And joining us now to tell us why the anniversaries of these events are worth observing. In Boston, Massachusetts, William Fowler, Jr., author and historian at Northeastern University. And Bill Fowler, it's so good to see you again. Thanks for coming on TVO tonight. How are you doing? Well, Steve, good day to you. It's a great pleasure and honor to be with you again. Thank you so much. We are going to talk about the treaty and about the proclamation in just a moment. Uh, but first of all, I think a little background is in order here. The Seven Years' War, about which you wrote so eloquently in your book, Empires at War, Thank what you. was it all about? Well, it began, uh, it was sparked by a frontier encounter between a young Virginia militia officer named Washington and the French. And from that spark in Western Virginia, that encounter, the war quickly spread until it became a world war. And in fact, Steve, it was the world's first world war. It encompassed the entire globe, probably cost the lives of more than a million men, caused the change of treaty and territory more than anything in a vast area, vaster than all the Roman Empire, and shaped the world in which we live today. And that George Washington, I gather, did go on to do a few important things in history, did he not? Yes, there were, he had a few things left in his agenda in life. I think so, yes. How did that Seven Years' War end? Well, it ended with, as you mentioned in the uh, promo in the introduction, it ended with the Treaty of Paris in 1763. Uh, it was a treaty, of course, by which uh, Canada, uh, New France, as it was often known, uh, became British. There were other islands that were swapped about around the world. And, but the fundamental point is it created the British Empire, which went on, of course, in the 19th century to draw the resources and riches to fund, to finance the Industrial Revolution, which did indeed change the world. And, of course, on this side of the border, it laid the groundwork, the preliminaries, I suppose, uh, for the creation of the American Republic. It also had a dramatic and uh, somewhat dismal impact, too, upon native peoples on both sides of our border. And how about the Royal Proclamation of 1763? What did that do? Well, that's an intriguing piece of history, Steve. Uh, the war, as you know, ended with the treaty in February of 1763. One of the causes, perhaps the principal cause of the war, had been the struggle over land west of the Alleghenies, land that had been in contention between the French and the English, and also native peoples who were resident there as well. Native peoples tended to ally with the French. The French colonial empire in North America was, if not compatible to native peoples, it was certainly less threatening. The French were interested in trade, fur primarily, whereas the British were interested in settling, chopping the trees down, and farming. So British interests were hostile to the Native American style of life. When the war was over in February 1763, the royal crown, George III, issued a proclamation in October of that year. The crown wished to keep British settlers away from Native peoples to keep these two hostile elements from encountering one another. The Crown also needed time to organize land west of the Appalachians. This vast empire needed to be surveyed, laid out. No one quite knew what was there. So the Proclamation of 1763 was intended as a short-term measure to keep the British settlers advancing westward away from the native peoples and to protect the interests of the native peoples until organization and law could be established. Uh, the colonials saw it as a vast, vast betrayal. Of course, they had been in the war to gain land, and now the Crown seemed to be denying them the very thing for which they had fought. And so the Proclamation Line of 1763, while in the interest of Native peoples, was certainly not in the interest of the American colonials and would indeed anger them deeply. Hmm. Now, as we look at many of the important documents throughout the last several hundred years, and maybe this question is unanswerable, but, um, but let's see. You've got the Declaration of Independence, your Constitution, our Constitution, and numerous other treaties along the way. But when you think about what North America looks like today, how high up the list would you put the significance of the two instruments that we've been referring to so far? 
Well, Steve, if we're looking at cause and effect in an historical context, without the Treaty of 1763, and certainly without the Proclamation Line of 1763, this whole continent, would, the history of this continent, would have been vastly different. One of the principal causes for the American Revolution would have been eliminated. The native peoples, certainly without the protection offered them by the crown, would have been thrust aside more quickly than they eventually were. And it seems to me that the American Revolution, as it evolved in 1775 and 1776, would not have occurred. That's not to say that eventually there might not have been some sort of separation, perhaps. But that separation would have come much, much later under very different circumstances. So these two events really did shape the world in which we live and were integral to what happened in the 18th century in the terms of the development both of the United States and certainly of Canada as well. All right, you say that, and we know that historians and journalists love nice round numbers, and 250 yes. is a nice round number. So yes. here we are. Yes. Yes. Uh, I guess the Treaty of Paris was signed in February, and the Royal Proclamation came out in October, right. so we're sort of halfway between those Correct. two dates right now. And in spite of the importance of this, and in spite of the nice round number of 250 years later, with the exception of this program, I think I've heard precious nothing about either of these two things all year long. Why is that? Well, Steve, because events following 1763 were like a tsunami, that the events around the American Revolution completely engulfed our history and put this particular event in the shadows. When Americans look at the 18th century and look at the American Revolution, they view, when they view, the Treaty of 1763 as sort of a, an introduction, a prelude to the main act, to the main show, which is the Revolution. And so the Seven Years' War is never really, really examined on its own merits and what it caused. So it did, did indeed become engulfed in this grand event called the Revolution. I am pleased to tell you, however, that a few minutes before I entered into the studio for this interview, I did a little homework. I'm pleased to tell you that on exhibit here in Boston right now, not so far from where I'm sitting, is indeed the Treaty of 1763, hmm. the original treaty on loan here in Boston from the British National Archives. So it does have some importance. Although I must tell you that when I went to see the exhibit, it's a beautiful, wonderful exhibit, it wasn't crowded, Steve. No, that doesn't surprise me, but I still want to find out how you felt when your eyes gazed upon that treaty, 250 years old that it is. Steve, my eyes gazed upon it, and I had the same reaction that I always do as an historian, to be in the presence of a great document. That document is as close as I will ever come to 1763 and the events that created that treaty. To me, being in the presence of great documents, whether it's the Treaty of 1763, the Declaration of Independence, and the other historic documents, the same for Canada as well, it is truly a, it's an emotional moment. And I think people need to consider that, to be there to see this artifact, this not living artifact, that would be an exaggeration certainly, but it is my connection, our connection to that moment in time. So it is somewhat emotional. I always wonder, though, what the criteria are for people determining what gets celebrated and what doesn't. And let me give you two quick examples, and then maybe you can weigh in after that. Right. Uh, we, of course, are coming through the 200th anniversary of the War of 1812 between our country and your country. And there was a, a lot of fuss made over that up here. Uh, the government made yes. a big deal about it. We had a, our a museum in Ottawa that focused a great deal on it, did a wonderful exhibit, mm -hmm. uh, television commercials, Indeed. the whole nine yards. Conversely, right. we also recently had the 30th anniversary of our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, which uh, I think most Canadians would tell you is an awfully big deal, and yet yes. next to nothing. No yes. official observances whatsoever. Yes. Why are some events remembered fondly, importantly, uh, and yet others not marked at all? Well, Steve, celebrations are about the present looking at the past. So when we think about what we choose to celebrate, I think it's often not the case of the actual importance of the event when it happened, but how we view it today. And there are a number of factors, I think, that go into that. Not the least of them, Steve, being political. 
you mentioned the War of 1812. Well, I can assure you that on this side of the border, while we certainly are remembering it, we're not celebrating it, Steve, because I think, and please don't broadcast this to my neighbors here in the States, but I think, in all fairness, we lost that war. We were lucky to come out of it as well as we did. And Canadians, on the other hand, have, have much to celebrate. And indeed, it was a war very important to your national identity, less important to us in terms of national identity. So in our own history, we haven't seen it as that important. We celebrated the bicentennial of our American Revolution, 1975-76. It was an event worth celebrating, to be sure, but it was also a moment when we we're trying to uh, reestablish the virtues and the symbols and the values of our republic having come through Watergate and the resignation of a president. So celebrating the origins of our republic was indeed a very important event for us in terms of reestablishing our own values. It also has to do, I think, with people. Uh, events are often remembered by people. American Revolution, George Washington. The Civil War, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the Wright Brothers' first flight. Uh, people have a way of resonating over time, more so than simply events. And to documents themselves, these incredible documents that we have that we identify with our history. So I think for all of these reasons, we tend to uh, select, and we do select, what we wish to remember. I'm also always taken aback by commemorations and celebrations. I do wish that we would have more cerebration about these things, that we would think about them in their context and in the context in which we view them today. Interestingly enough, a, a connection to the Canadian uh, Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Do you know that in Section 25 of that charter that you just mentioned, the treaty, uh, the proclamation line of 1763 is specifically mentioned. It is specifically mentioned in your charter uh, as an indication of the rights of Native peoples. History lives. It does indeed, Steve. It does indeed. And it remains exciting to me. At least I always, I never tire <clears throat> of wanting to know more. I'm a curious person, and I hope my students are curious as well to know how did we get to be where we are? Who came before us, and what did they do? I guess in our last minute here, that's probably a good thing to pick up on, which is we depend on people like you. We depend on people to make history come to life in the classroom so that the next generation yes. cares as, much, as yes. much about it as the previous yes. one does, too. How are we doing on that front? Yeah. Well, Steve, I don't think we're doing too well on that. I think that uh, what I see from enrollments in history on this side of the border, certainly in our secondary schools, is that it has been uh, elbowed out of the curriculum. A curriculum is something which is very political, and at every level, curriculum is political. And that which is seen as most important today is put into the curriculum today. And when something comes in, something goes out. And so many things have come into our curriculum, some of them silly, I think, but nonetheless, they have edged their way into the curriculum. Things must leave. And all too often, what leaves is our past. And that is indeed a very sad, sad commentary. Well, we thank you for coming on TVO tonight, bringing it to life. Bill Fowler, it's always a delight to have you on our program. Thanks so much. Well, thank you very much, Steve. It's always a delight to be with you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.